Hi everyone, thank you so much. I'm gonna take off my mask um, while speaking and just stay back a little bit, but hopefully you can hear me better this way. Um, thank you so much for coming to our session. We apologize for the confusion. I'm Erin Aoyama and this is Sandy Sugawara and Katiana Garcia Gil Kilroy. And um, we met actually in the midst of working on our various projects last summer. And so this year we saw we were all three of us presenting and thought, why don't we do them together? Um, because as you'll hopefully see, there's some really nice resonances between our projects. Um, and we thought we could maybe have a really nice conversation all together, all of us in this room, um, after we sort of share with you some of what we're doing. So. Here we are. We've planned to save about 20 to 30 minutes at the end for discussion, for questions, for reflection, um, especially to hear from you all if you're comfortable about what brought you here to Cody and to Heart Mountain and what the experience has been like for you. We know that this pilgrimage is jam-packed um, and there's a lot to do and a lot of people to see, so we're hoping to also give a little bit of time to sit together and, and think about what it's like to be here in, in preparation for tomorrow when we'll really be at the site. So please feel free to jot down some thoughts um, as we're speaking. If you're comfortable sharing at the end, we'd love to have folks share, um, or just you know whatever comes to you at the end. So I'm here, I'm Erin Aoyama, and I am presenting on behalf of myself and my dear friend and colleague, Nicole Sintetis. Um, we are both PhD candidates at Brown University in American Studies, um, but Nicole actually just moved from Providence, Rhode Island. There's some seats up front or anywhere, wherever is good. Um, just moved from Providence, Rhode Island to Santa Barbara, California, where she will be the head of the English department at a boarding school there. So, and also finishing her dissertation. So she's not here with us today, but she's very much here in spirit. So I wanted to just share this photo of us at the end of our last research trip in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, we do a lot of work of traveling to incarceration sites and places that are kind of out of the way. Ice cream is a very important part of our research methodology. Um, and we make time for fun as much as we can too and really trying to get to know a place. So we did go dog sledding in Alaska, which was awesome. Um, it was not winter time. So we were very much in like the woods and there were the biggest mosquitoes I've ever seen. Um, but it was very fun. So I just wanted to have Nicole up here um, and also take a moment, I think something that's important to me as a historian and just as a community member is to think about citational practice and to think about all of the people who've been part of this project are now called Seeing Memory Project, but also just part of this pilgrimage, part of this community that have made my work and Nicole's work and our work together possible. So I won't, I started trying to list everyone out on a slide and I was going to forget people and it was getting too long, um, but just to say a big thank you to folks in this room um, who, you know, have been so important to us. Our project was originally called the Japanese American Memory Scape Project. We are a National Park Service JAX grant, so those Japanese American Confinement Sites grants. Um, funded project and we recently changed our name um, we're working with a really wonderful team of web designers and a creative director and we decided to change our name to seeing memory and of course because we're academics there is a subtitle which is landscapes of Japanese American incarceration um, as you'll hear from me in just a little bit we're really trying to think about what it means to look at the landscape of a place and hear the stories, engage with what memory is and looks like there, and then also engage with the way that what's not there is still an important part of the story. Um, so we are centered around five Department of Justice, U.S. Army, INS internment camps, and citizen isolation centers um, for this first part of our project. So we're working on Fort Missoula in Missoula, Montana, Kuski internment camp in Idaho, Catalina Federal Honor Camp, or prison camp number 10 in Arizona, Baca camp in New Mexico, and Fort Richardson in Alaska. And I'm happy to talk about why these sites and what they have in common, et cetera, in the Q&A if you are interested in. Um, so we have traveled to these sites. We've brought along drones with us. We were inspired by Kishibashi and his <laughs> film director, which that's only half of a joke. Um, so we are licensed drone pilots, um, and we're using drone imagery, 360 GoPro photography, um, and audio clips, regular photography, um, oral histories, scholar interviews, memories from local community folks, from tribal historians and native communities as the sort of foundation of this storytelling project. So we're building a website. That is what the Seeing Memory Project will be. Um, 
that will allow really students, we're sort of geared towards students and educators, but also interested folks, stakeholders from across various communities, um, to go on a virtual walking tour of these sites. Because as you all know from getting out here to Cody, these camps were built in places that remain hard to get to. These smaller INS, US Army, DOJ internment camps are even you know smaller, harder to get to sometimes, or there's less marking. There aren't interpretive centers. There aren't even signs. Um, and so we wanted to think about how we could bring these sites out, um, make them more accessible, while holding on as much as we could to some of the guys um, place-based you know power of being somewhere and seeing the stories and hearing the stories that are there. Um, so some of what we're doing is also comparing historic images. Um, this is Fort Missoula, sort of an aerial shot, looking at where the barracks were on um, the grounds of the camp, with then a present day, like that uh, slide effect there, shot of almost exactly the same angle, um, looking at you know where the barracks are now. Fort Missoula today is an incredibly beautiful community park. There's like eight soccer fields, there's basketball courts, there's a historical museum, um, but there's all these really interesting traces there. And so as Nicole and I were sort of walking around on our first visit, we're walking around this dog park and you see all these you know foundations of barracks and things. And we're wondering sort of what people who go to that park with their dogs or to go for a walk or to play a soccer game, what they're thinking about, if they're thinking about it, maybe they know um, what used to be a prison is there. And this is sort of another angled shot of the barracks at Fort Missoula, side by side, but I know it's too, kind of too small to see up there. Um, and then one of our other sites, Catalina Federal Honor Camp, in Tucson, this is an aerial photograph from the 40s, so you can see some of the barracks buildings um, of the prison there. And this is an almost from the exact same angle. You can see the trees and vegetation have changed, but we'll see it closer later. There's sort of the outline of where the foundations of all of the buildings were, and now they're campgrounds. So that's where you sort of park your car and set up a tent um, right on top of the um, foundation of the barracks. So the five sites that we're working on by and large tend to be left out of most histories of Japanese American incarceration for many reasons. Um, in part this is because they were used to detain relatively small numbers and mostly Issei. So mostly those that sort of community leader generation who were not American citizens which is significant at these sites and also didn't speak English in most cases and so a lot of what was left behind um, was not in English or, you know, is, is difficult for researchers who don't speak Japanese to access. Um, and to further sort of complicate the preservation and the interpretation at these sites, which also hold histories of native removal and genocide, many of these locations remain multi-purpose sites. So many of them are campgrounds today, or one is still an army base, um, more of them are campgrounds. So there's just a lot of sort of layers that are there that continue to this day, but that make visiting them especially interesting. So our work on the Seeing Memory Project is driven by the belief that the landscape is a crucial piece of the archive of Japanese American confinement, that it is itself infused, itself infused with memory and history. In essence, a memory scape, which was the original name of our project, um, or a memorial landscape that can help to combine community and place as historical storytellers, like what we are all doing here this weekend on pilgrimage. So I wanna walk through sort of one example of our site um, that is, we don't play favorites among our sites, but this is definitely sort of one of the most interesting ones um, to show a little bit of what we're hoping to have on our website, which will be launched, I think, in early fall, but um, I don't have anything to show you just yet. So the Gordon Hirabayashi Campground today, formerly prison camp number 10, also called the Catalina Federal Honor Camp, is in the Catalina Mountains, about 25 miles from Tucson, Arizona. So this is where Gordon Hirabayashi was imprisoned for a time before he went to McNeil Island um, after he violated the curfew and exclusion orders. And in 1999, this site was dedicated and renamed the Gordon Hirabayashi Recreation Area. Has anyone been there? Anyone from Arizona? Yeah, Natasha! Okay, great. <laughs> that corner. I love it. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful campground. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of mountain biking and hiking, and there's a lot of rock climbing out there. And so the rock climbing area is called the prison camp climbing area. So it's not subtle in a lot of these places, but I'm sort of like, okay, we're on prison camp road. What, you know, what does all this mean? 
but that's as my mom has told me that's just how I look at everything so I realize that's not always exciting for people so this is a single site <laughs> thanks for laughing up here um, that raises really important questions about the construction of borders of citizenship the use of prison labor to build infrastructure and the ongoing and violent erasure of indigeneity and to show how Japanese American stories fit into those histories as well and how to use technology like drones um, and GoPro videos to really see more and hear hear more about these stories. So prison camp number 10 was established in 1933, just seven years after the past, I had to do that math really quickly, of the 1924 Immigration Act um, to build a road from Tucson up to Summerhaven, which was a beautiful town, a sort of summer retreat for wealthy white Tucsonians in the Catalina Mountains. So the road, which looks like looked like this when it was being built, winds and stretches nearly 30 miles up Mount Lemmon, which was known as Frog Mountain, to the Tono Odom, the native tribe on whose land the road is built, and it took nearly two decades to complete. So this is sort of what road building looked like, something I've learned a lot about um, in the last six months in the 1930s. So when the prison was first established, it imprisoned mostly Mexican nationals who were arrested crossing the border, which is about 70 miles south of here, and then other men who were arrested for violating federal law. So an interesting sort of story behind trying to get this prison established, there's um, someone who calls himself General Hitchcock. He was postmaster general. Um, and he sort of advocated for using prisons as part of sort of the progressive era prison um, philosophy, using prison labor to rehabilitate um, and to also sort of build infrastructure that was needed. So his idea was to have a prison here so that the road could be built. So the road is very, very closely tied to this prison. Also, this is established right after sort of the construction of the southern border in 1924, when crossing that line between, you know, what is now Mexico Mexico into the United States um, becomes a crime. And so these men are arrested um, and building the first, I'm sorry, I think my slides are a little out of order, um, building the first seven miles of the road, living in tents, and then they built the prison itself and then the rest of the road up the mountain. During World War II, other prisoners arrived, Jehovah's Witnesses, other conscientious objectors, Hopi draft resistors, and eventually Japanese American draft resistors. So Gordon Hirabayashi is the first Japanese American. He's later joined by draft resistors from Amachi, Topaz, and Poston. Um, and famously, Gordon hitchhiked most of the way from Spokane, Washington to Tucson. Um, he had opted, he wanted to serve his sentence at a road camp rather than at a county jail. But the nearest road camp to where he was arrested was within the exclusion zone. And the district attorney told him that the government would not pay for his transportation to Arizona. And so Gordon said, okay, I'll get there myself, no problem. And they let him. Um, so he, he hitchhiked. Um, there are some stories, I haven't been able to totally confirm this, but that he visited his family and he visited friends in the exclusion zone on his way down. It apparently took him longer than he anticipated and was harder because of gas rationing. Um, so he has stories of like sleeping in ditches and all this stuff. Um, and eventually he had to buy a bus ticket in Las Vegas to make it the rest of the way down. Once he got to Tucson, prison staff could not find his papers. Um, and so they tried to send him back home. But Gordon, you know, balked at that idea, wanted to serve his sentence, wanted to serve it at this particular prison. So camp staff, the prison guards, suggested he go out for dinner and a movie while they sorted everything out. So this was Gordon's journey into incarceration here. Um, he described his time at Tucson as life-changing. He built strong relationships with others imprisoned with him. There's sort of infamous stories of Gordon participating in a hair washing ceremony with the Hopi draft resistors who were there. Um, and he built strong, resist strong relationships with the other conscientious objectors, famously not the Jehovah's Witnesses who were there. Um, but this group called themselves the Tucsonians and were joined by other Japanese Americans. After World War II, um, the road was completed in 1951, and the prison remained a border patrol site until the late 1960s, when it was abandoned by the US government and became a labor camp for juvenile delinquents. In the early 1970s, the site became a privately owned rehab center for troubled native youth, all of these things in quotations, um, before being shut down after an FBI investigation into abuses. Shortly after that, all of the buildings at this site were torn apart and taken down because there were concerns that people would start living in the buildings. And so you have all these foundations all over the site. Um, there's the remains of a bit of a playground because there were children who lived there with their parents who were working as prison guards. Um, and it's still, as I said, a very popular campground and recreational site. 
Um, so it's a place that also connects a lot of important pieces of Japanese American history and stories of resistance, and it holds these histories of overlapping layers of incarceration, racism, and trauma through these different periods in American history. And it pulls together, kind of through the character of Gordon Hirabayashi in an interesting way, the namesake of this campsite, um, a thread to illustrate how Japanese American history can be a helpful starting point or a lens through which to see the layers of history that intersect and, and remain sort of present at these sites. Um, so this is a screen grab or a sort of um, some of our drone footage. Um, this was the very first time that I had ever flown a drone, mm -hmm. and it's really incredible. You can just see how beautiful this road is. Um, it's one of the top listed attractions if you're in the Tucson area. There's tons of bikers on this road constantly, which is very impressive. Um, but it it brought up this question for Nicole and I as we were there, how do or how should we interact with spaces that we now think of as recreational or productive but became that way through prison labor? Maybe sounds very familiar to some of what we've learned about Heart Mountain. Um, how do we learn to see who built the road? That is not a question that I ask myself often, but now anytime I'm on a highway or a state road, it's a question of, you know, how did this come to be? Oftentimes it's not prison labor, but more often than you would think, um, it actually is. And so how, how can our understanding of the United States and our place within it shift if we can learn to see kind of more clearly these layered histories? Um, I want to show a few other clips um, from other sites. This is also some drone footage. Um, there was a baseball field at this prison camp, as there were at many of the World War II incarceration sites. One thing that we did learn as sort of a, a nice, funny thing at each of the sites that incarcerated Issei, there was a baseball field, sometimes there was a golf course, and there was always a fishing spot. The Issei would always find a way to fish. Um, so this is um, from December. You can see the sort of pullouts where cars park um, and tents are set up. And then this sort of open space in the back is still the same shape as the baseball field um, from during the war. So we're flying our drones and kind of freaking people out a little bit um, as we did this. But you can see it's a, this was a busy morning there. Um, and this is just to give an example. I apologize for the kind of shakiness of this, it's not the best quality, but this is from GoPro footage. So this is um, one of us walking around to sort of capture so that folks can sort of visit our website and have this experience of like choosing where to look around, walk, you can hear, not on this, but the sound of sort of the gravel crunching below you. Um, this is a screen grab of Nicole sort of navigating a 360 image. So you can look all up and down and around. You've probably seen these on Facebook and, and that kind of thing. Um, but it really kind of lets you get a sense of what the landscape is like. Um, and this is used to be sort of the sewage area in the camp that now is just this, has all this debris and staircases and sort of leftover pieces of the prison there as well. This is just a little more. I had a lot of fun with a GoPro. Um, um, and this is sort of walking towards the baseball field, which now is a place where people park their horses. Uh, that might not be the correct <laughs> It's where the horses hang out. Um, yeah, and this is just, again, the juxtaposition of the baseball field from during the war and then the baseball field today. So you can kind of see. Um, it is a challenge, actually. We really want to pair archival images with like the same shot from today. Um, archaeologists are very, very good at that, so we've had some help from really wonderful friends who are archaeologists and finding software that helps you do that. Um, but some of it you need to use your imagination a little bit. So one of our other sites is Fort Missoula that I mentioned, um, which during World War II um, was turned over from the Army to Border Patrol to the um, DOJ and then Immigration and Naturalization Services to be used as an alien detention center. Fort Missoula has a fantastic website. You can also sort of take a tour, um, so to speak. So we're working a lot with their um, historical center to sort of ask what they need, what we can help them with, and link folks out to. Um, but this is a place that between 1941 and 1944 held a total of um, 1,200 non-military Italian men, 1,000 Issei men, 2,000 German resident aliens, and 123 Japanese Latin Americans. So a range of folks held here. This is an original guard tower. Um, that had some really interesting graffiti uh, on the inside of it that we did not take photos of. Um, and this is sort of the remains of one of the barracks. Um, 
and just again sort of the field that all of the barracks were on in the 40s. Um, and this is what it looks like today. So it's a really beautiful site um, with again all these sort of foundations not as clearly remaining as at Tucson um, but still very much there. And um, Fort Missoula has all these really beautiful river stones. Um, April, my friend in the back who's really into rock hounding, could be an interesting place for you. But there are all these stories about Issei men collecting these river stones. Um, so there's something at Fort Missoula that they nicknamed Stone Fever, uh, where the Issei men would build and make all of these sort of bridges and outdoor features and then vases, pieces of art often that they'd send to family members in other camps. And these are still all over the site. So we were walking around with someone and ran into this and I was like, oh, this is kind of an interesting collection of stones. And he was like, oh yeah, yeah, that was probably made by the Issei. And for me as a Japanese American person and as a historian, it was like, we need to save this and protect it. Like we don't have that much from the Issei remaining for so many reasons. Um, I think it is beyond repair. I tried to get some folks to be interested in it, um, but it just shows all of this sort of, you can see it literally crumbling back into the earth here. So I kept taking pictures of stones everywhere because it just felt like these are the traces also of these people who were here. It also snowed while we were there. This is a vase, it's not a great quality picture, um, but a vase made out of those stones that's just tucked away in another museum that one of the guards from Fort Missoula had. Um, maybe was given to him or he took sort of with him when he left and then he donated back um, to this Rocky Mountain Military History Museum that's on the site. This is the courtroom at Fort Missoula, which maybe some of you have seen, um, or at least reenactments of. There was enemy alien board hearings at, at all of the DOJ INS camps. They had these um, hearings. This one was tucked away as Forest Service um, cubicles, basically. So it was really buried under um, like this sort of white paneling that you can see above. And this historical archeologist who was working at the museum sort of one day like pulled up, a, was looking at blueprints and pulled up a board and realized that this was where the um, courtroom had been, where all of these hearing boards had met and sort of determined the fate of all of these Issei men, including Min Yasui's father. Um, and so she and a team sort of excavated this courtroom and they did some reconstruction to make it look like this. This is an incredibly haunting room to walk into. You can just sort of sense all of the lives that were on the line, feeling tense. There's sort of a famous story of Min Yasui going to his father's hearing, but he wasn't allowed to speak. So he was just sort of sitting there. Um, so it's really like a powerful room. I'm sort of getting chills remembering being there. Um, Nicole and I talked to another historian the next day after we went to this courtroom who said to us, it didn't look like that. Like Diane decided to make the courtroom look like this because it's beautiful and it's really austere and it gives you the sense that something important happened here. Um, which was really interesting to hear, I think, just like, yeah, I guess we don't know what it looked like. We know what happened there. And so this seems to be a way of sort of interpreting that for folks, but important to remember that the memory is a little bit murky perhaps around this. Um, one of our other sites is Baca Camp in New Mexico, which is probably one of the smaller sites. Um, this was run by Border Patrol. It was, it held about 30 plus um, Japanese Americans. 10 of them had been Issei men who were railroad workers in Clovis, New Mexico, well outside of the exclusion zone. Um, but they and their families were rounded up and removed by the border patrol for their own safety um, and taken to Baca camp where then there was a lot of sort of debate over who was in charge of them and what would happen to them. I was thinking about Dakota's line in the film earlier about how it wasn't intentional punishment that these things happened, but just negligence. So you had <clears throat> 32 Japanese Americans, 23 of whom were children, living in this sort of former civilian conservation corps camp, no insulation, no cooking, no materials for schools. So they wrote out to try and have a teacher come for the year that they were living there and no local school districts would send them a teacher. So the oldest child, who was about a 16-year-old young woman, ended up teaching all of the children for the year that they were there before eventually being transferred to WRA camps and sort of meeting back up with their families. None of those folks ever returned to New Mexico. So this is what it looks like today. There's really nothing there. It's very hard to get to. We had to follow some Forest Service folks there. There is a poster um, there at sort of the campsite and it's hard to see and I couldn't believe this but it talks about the history of the camp so it talks about it as a CCC camp as a girls camp and then this section is just torn off 
And this is when it talks about when it was Baca camp, when it held Japanese Americans. And before, we were all sort of like very shocked because it's a really remote place. And someone tried to say like, you know, maybe it was the wind that yeah. took this part off. Um, but I think it's just an interesting, you know, you, ha you go to these sites and you feel a little bit of the like, oh, this is still something that is hard to talk about or is going to make some folks upset or shouldn't belong to this part of the history. Um, so it makes me wonder always what else is there that we don't know, that we don't talk about at these sites. Um, another site of ours is Kuski Internment Camp, which is in northern-ish Idaho, not totally up in the Panhandle. One of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. Um, this was the most sort of remote and unmarked site that we went to. So we had a really wonderful conversation with Stacy Camp, who's an archeologist at Michigan State, done a lot of work on Kuski with Priscilla Wagers, who's at University of Idaho. Um, and so we used this hand-drawn map from a former attorney that he sort of drew in from memory um, to try and figure out where we were. Um, there are some really interesting stories from our visit to this place that I'd be happy to tell you maybe over a beer at some point. Um, but I will say that we, Stacy connected us with two of her friends who live in the area to bring us out to this site. And they were both retired circus clowns. And that was actually the least weird part of that day. <laughs> so just a really kind of fascinating place, but beautiful. So on the other side, there's this creek that runs through it. And on the other side is where the baseball field was. Um, and eventually we got some sheriffs to t show us kind of how to hike down uh, to see where, what was over there, because there's this really creepy incinerator that's just sort of still there, covered in some moss, and it's just, has a very dark feeling to it. Even though we know this was just a trash incinerator, there's something that's just haunting about it and um, it's left over there. This is um, some drone footage of what we couldn't walk to, which is where there was a baseball field, again, at this site as well, that sort of you can see the outline of here. Um, they had a ton of rain when we were out there in May. So the creek there is running really, really high, so we couldn't get over to this spot easily. But you could see it pretty clearly on the drone footage. Um, Kuski was another federal road building prison camp. Um, so the story goes that once um, there were some Issei men who were going to be sent to Kuski, the prisoners who'd been held there sort of became the guards who watched over, detained, imprisoned the Issei men who were there who built the road also that runs along Kuski, which is U.S. Highway 12. Interestingly, U.S. Highway 12 connects Montana, Missoula, Montana, to this part of Idaho, the Lewis and Clark Highway. Beautiful. Um, but Japanese American men were building it from both ends during the war. Um, we had a really hard time finding where the barracks were at this site because there's been rock slides and things have changed there, but eventually we sort of flipped the map upside down, or neither of us is that good at, well, Nicole's good at reading the map, I'm not very good. Um, and we sort of went up this little hill and kicked around a little bit, and you can see these like peeking through of cement underneath. We are not the people to discover this, like the archeologists have already found all of this, they've done very extensive digs here, but they're still, you know, to be the first people there in like seven years or so, and to be able to have the experience of digging through something, to see this peeking up, Again, that question of like, what else is underneath here that we don't see and we don't associate with this site? Um, and then our last site that we were at in June is Fort Richardson in Alaska. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go too much into these stories, but it's another site where there were a few Issei men and Nisei men held. Um, and the sort of theme at each of these sites is that there's so much people don't know. It's so difficult to get a complete list of everyone who was held at these places because people were moving around, names are misspelled. The army keeps terrible records. They know they can tell you the like insignia of every unit that moves through a base, but they don't have records of men that they held as prisoners for seven months. So that was a surprising thing to me. Um, this was the internment camp and it's a parking lot. Um, and so there's some sort of wooded area that you can walk around. Um, we could sort of walk the length um, or the perimeter of the, the camp, um, but it's now the Marines, it's a Marines building. Um, so I don't have great photos of it because I was told not to get any license plates or people in it. Um, and then this, sort of inset picture is Nicole sort of pointing out the fence ran along basically the tree line right there. Um, and so pointing out to, this is in the left corner, uh, Marie Matsuno Nash, who was actually born at Minidoka, but she is Aleut and Japanese American. So her dad um, was briefly held at Fort Richardson before being sent to Minidoka. And her mother, who was Aleut, asked to join her father at Minidoka with her older brother. And that's where Marie was born. So really interesting stories here. 
Okay, so I'm gonna wrap things up to sort of pass it off to Katiana and Sandy. Um, one of my favorite things about getting to sort of know both of you and work with both of you is hearing your stories from going to these sites. We met up in Arkansas, actually, where we both were. Um, and, you know, just so many things happen. So many people end up helping you and to, like showing you where to go or getting your car out of the mud or things like that. Um, and so it's been really fun to sort of share some of these stories. I think I speak for all of us when I say we're very happy to keep talking. We want to hear your experiences also of being here or going to some of these sites. Um, and I want to just end by saying sort of the core questions of our Seeing Memory project. Really ask, what is the relationship between what we see and what we remember? And how does the landscape itself hold memory? How can absence serve as its own kind of evidence? And how can we use these questions to narrate the past in many voices? So we are still in the very early stages of this project, as you can probably tell. Love to hear feedback. You all are very important stakeholders. I know we have teachers in the room and community members, and et cetera. So please, I'd love to hear any thoughts. Um, and please stay in touch with us. I, I'm terrible at updating our Instagram. It's still under the old name, but it will be updated soon and we'll, we'll have our website. Um, and we really see this as kind of a partnership with all of the folks that we want to be part of these stories. So thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it off to Sandy and Katiana. There's no mic here. I know my voice is not very loud. So I hope everyone can hear me. <laughs> um, well, first of all, we're really glad that Aaron had the idea of combining our, our two projects because um, they're both about memory and landscape. And I think put together, they're sort of, you get the whole picture. Um, we're approaching it much differently, and our end project will be a photo book. But ultimately, both projects raise the same questions about race, about belonging, and about the meaning of citizenship. Uh, we focused on the 10 uh, mass incarceration camps, and we're going to give you a quick spin through of each one. Um, we spend a lot of time in each of the camps, and, um, and um, Katiana will talk a little bit more about uh, the structure. But I'm going to start with Amachi, because that's where my parents were. Should we turn off the lights? I think you can see the photos a little better. Thank you. Um, maybe turn one on oh, so I can oh, see. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's that's fine. Um, so um, my parents were on Machi, which is uh, why I'm starting with that one, and also because one of the, my most important encounters I think happened in Machi. I was um, uh, walking uh, around the camp uh, one morning, a, a few days after we'd gotten there, and this couple came up to me. They were a white couple. And they said, um, were you here? And I said, no, but my parents were. And they started profusely apologizing. And they said they had no idea that this had happened, that they had been driving down the road, and they'd seen a sign, and they decided to stop by for a couple hours. Well, we ran into them. Amachi um, is in uh, Granada, Colorado. And we ran into them at a little restaurant that evening when we were having dinner. And they said they were so moved that they, um, that they ended up spending the whole day there. And they were going to return the next day with their family. So it made me realize that, that they could feel the memories of our families and our ancestors there. And it made me realize how important a sense of place is and how important it is that we preserve um, these uh, sites, both preserve them physically, preserve them through art, through photography. And this is a picture I took at um, uh, Amachi. Uh, it's the foundation um, of, the, of the barracks, but to me it looks like coffins rising up out of the, the landscape. This is uh, where my grand, I, I think this is my grandmother's barracks. <laughs> it's a little hard to tell, but uh, from the address and um, she was a social worker at Amachi. She, she spent a lot of time talking to families that were just crushed. They had lost everything. They had, you know, lost their life savings. Some of them s told her they couldn't send their sons to college. They had lost, some of them had lost family members. This is a gravestone for baby Matsuda. Um, they were 
they were felt isolated, they were lonely. As you know, many of them felt very ashamed because they were used to always being good citizens. Um, we found that the landscape at Amachi was imbued with anger and with sadness. But my grandmother was also impressed with how quickly her neighbors made the place beautiful, planting flowers and trees. Many of the trees still exist. If you've been there, you've probably been really taken by that. And I think they're graceful tributes to the never give up spirit of the Japanese American community there. I also want to do a shout out to John Hopper. Uh, if anybody's been to Amachi or if they're planning to go, they should really um, try to meet him. Uh, his his uh, students, he and his students um, for years uh, uh, took the responsibility of trying to keep Amachi in good shape. They volunteered to cut the grass. And, um, and they volunteered to give tours when people came. It's, it's truly remarkable how the community really got behind the preservation of Amachi. And now, as most of you know, it's um, part of the National Park Service, but, but John and his students really got us there, so I really appreciate that. Um, now I'm gonna pass it on to Katiana, who will do Tule Lake. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Um, so Tule Lake, as many of you know, is in Northern California, in the border with Oregon, a very desolate place. Um, we didn't even find a hotel there, so we had to stay at a hunting lodge, which was a very interesting experience, which we could also go over a beer, like, uh, <laughs> over Erin's beer. <laughs> Um, no, nowhere to eat. There was one very tiny little Mexican restaurant, and thank God it was there because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to eat anywhere. Um, so Tule Lake uh, was very important for uh, the title of our book uh, because it inspired the title, uh, Show Me the Way to Go to Home. And um, this, uh, we think, is a misquote of a popular song at the time. But uh, we find it's really uh, telling of uh, you know, the desire of, of Japanese Americans uh, to do something that seems so simple, but it was impossible at the time to just go back home. So uh, in each uh, chapter of the book, well, each camp had a very distinct uh, personality, uh, which was very surprising. So each camp is very different. And uh, the way we organize the structure of the book is that um, we picked uh, a person uh, that was related to the, to the camp, that had been at the camp, and whose life uh, reflected on those features that we found distinctive of that camp. So we either interviewed the person, if he or she were alive, or, or, he or her, his or her descendants, um, and then we collected also some uh, personal memories uh, from these people, uh, archival photographs or documents and artifacts, which are included in each uh, chapter of the book together with the photographs. Um, and then uh, at the end of the, of the book, uh, there's a very interesting essay uh, by Donna Nogata, who I think is here, but I because of the masks, uh, I, I cannot see her. Okay, she's there, <laughs> thank you very much, Donna, for being here. Um, uh, which is an essay about the, the impact, um, the multi-generational impact of the incarceration experience on those who didn't go to the camps. No? And Donna is a professor from uh, the University of Michigan and has done extensive research on the topic. So, so the person who, who we picked for Tule Lake is Hiroshi Shimizu, who is the little boy uh, in the photograph. And we have there uh, three generations. We have uh, Hiroshi's grandfather, who was an Issei, um, his parents, and his baby sister, uh, who was born in Tule Lake. Uh, Hiroshi was born in Topaz. So, um, Hiroshi's father was a San Francisco journalist, and um, at some point uh, when the family was at the assembly center, uh, they were notified 
that they had been selected randomly to be deported to Japan, uh, despite them uh, being uh, US citizens and not wanting to go to Japan at all. Uh, that, but they said, the State Department said that they had to go. Um, so they were sent to Ellis Island, uh, where there was a boat uh, deporting uh, Japanese Americans uh, or Issei back into Japan. And uh, luckily, they missed the boat uh, because there was no place uh, there. But they were tagged as uh, dangerous uh, <coughs> citizens. So that's why they were sent to Tule Lake. No? And then in Tule Lake, uh, well, uh, the grandfather uh, became very mentally ill, uh, so he um, tried to commit suicide twice, and he ended up being interned in a, um, in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, and then, because of all the pressures that were taking place in Tule Lake, uh, Hiroshi's parents decided to renounce to their citizenship. Also, uh, because they were told that uh, they were likely to be deported at some stage to Japan, and if they were identified as U.S. citizens, uh, they would be really very badly treated as traitors in Japan. So, so there were uh, all these things that were randomly happening to them, uh, or that they were leading to them take the wrong decisions. No? Uh, which you know we found that uh, is, is very telling from the, the experience that a lot of people had. No? Um, so this is a, a photograph of um, uh, the jail that was built within Tule Lake. is the only camp that had a jail, so it was a jail within a jail. Uh, you can see how uh, you know it's not a nice place to be. <laughs> um, it, that's that's what it looks like uh, at the moment. Um, this is the uh, outside of the jail. Um, this is, um, again, the inside of the jail. This is the visitor's room, uh, although it was never used because families in the camp were not allowed uh, to visit uh, the jail. So um, Hiroshi's father, uh, Iwao Shimizu, he was put in the jail again for no reason. And um, he has, uh, he wrote a very interesting journal uh, from his days in the, in the prison. Um, so we selected a quote that's in the book uh, that we thought you know, we would share with you now. So they, they came in and robbed all our food, cigarettes, silver valuables, and money. After all, the soldiers here are protecting us. So we could not do anything but to watch this burglary take place. We even watched some of them take and wear our kimonos. We stood in the snow for about three hours, watching them raid our things. One young soldier seemed like he was losing all self-control. We felt so furious and helpless at the same time. Um, so um, I also wanted to take the opportunity of Tule Lake to talk about Wayne Collins. Uh, some of, many of you will know about him. So he was a Caucasian uh, lawyer from San Francisco. Um, he was a civil rights attorney. And um, he decided at some point to dedicate his whole life uh, to help uh, renunciants to the citizenship, Japanese Americans, to get back their citizenship. So he spent about 20 plus years of his life uh, helping uh, all these Japanese Americans. He, and he managed to uh, solve about uh, 5,000 plus uh, cases. No? Uh, and uh, Hiroshi's uh, family was actually one of the families that benefited uh, from Wayne Collins. So these are some barracks uh, close to Tule Lake. This is again another scene. Uh, this is a, 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 gar a garage in uh, Tule Lake from, from the time. So there's still uh, quite a few buildings. And I'll pass it on to Sandy now. So for the Topaz chapter, we decided to focus on Chiru Obata. Uh, in large part because several years ago I bought uh, Obata's 
Topaz Moon book uh, that was put together by his granddaughter, Kimmy Hill. And um, it was one of the things that really inspired me to want to go and see the camps. Um, when I, uh, when it was filled with his painting and his sketching. One of them was um, a painting of an incredible bright red sky at sunset in um, Delta, Utah, which is where um, Topaz is located. And so when we were there, I saw the sky and I recognized it immediately from his paintings. And I said, that's an Obata's uh, sunset. Um, he also um, had a lot of sketches of everyday life. So we tried to capture the feeling of everyday life when we were at Topaz. This is um, the latrine, one of the latrines. This is a baseball field. Well, at Topaz, Obata started an art school, and it really um, gave incarcerees, um, it helped them, many incarcerees find their voice. In our photos, we sought to capture the sense of solitude and beauty we found in Obata's work. I particularly like this quote from him. If I hadn't gone to that kind of place, I wouldn't have noticed the beauty that exists in that bleakness. Okay. So I'll be talking now together about Poston and Gila River. Uh, so the common feature they have is not only both of them are in Arizona, but they're also in uh, Indian reservations. And that makes them very distinct. Um, so in, and there are differences between the two. So uh, Boston was run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And it was, so the uh, Indian tribes they resisted a lot to have the camps uh, located in their land. But um, they had so much pressure that at the end it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really even giving in. No? So it's, the administration would say, this is happening, so, so you need to agree with it. In exchange, uh, they were promised uh, to get some uh, benefits uh, for the rights of using their land. Uh, which not always happened. Um, so in the case of Boston, um, it was different than Hilla River. Boston was managed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which made, made a huge difference. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had been for many years, uh, before the 40s, trying to build infrastructure uh, so that they could uh, group most of the um, uh, uh, tribes that were around the Colorado River. Um, so they found that this was a great opportunity. They could use all the labor that the, the Japanese would bring, uh, both in building the infrastructure, the canals, the irrigation. So they uh, themselves acknowledged that they greatly benefited uh, from, from the camp. So uh, in addition to all the farming infrastructure, um, they built um, a whole uh, school complex uh, with adobe bricks um, that at the beginning was used as for schooling uh, under the camps. And then it was reused uh, by the, um, the Colorado River Indian tribes as a, as a community center. This is uh, the former uh, auditorium uh, which was relatively well preserved until, um, you know, after the camp's time, until it got it caught fire and it was mostly destroyed. Um, these are some of the remains um, of of the buildings. Um, so in uh, Boston, um, we picked um, the person we picked to feature was uh, Ruth Okimoto. Uh, so she was in Boston as a little girl, and then she went back as as an adult. Um, and she, you know, she even in her words, uh, 
she she found that the camp uh, was a, somehow a home for her, uh, mostly because of the very strong friendships and relationships that uh, she built with the Colorado, Colorado River Indian tribes. No? So she used this as an opportunity um, to do um, uh, to research over the relationship of the. Uh, Colorado River Indian tribes and the camps. So she actually has one of the most interesting uh, research pieces uh, that are out there about this relationship and how Boston uh, came about. No? Um, and then through her relationship, she also got a strong commitment uh, from the Colorado River Indian tribes for the preservation uh, of the site. So you see that these paintings, for example, were built uh, when the buildings were used as a community center. And this is one of the canals that are very close, you know, cut across the, the camp. Uh, for Hiller River, there are no photos, unfortunately, <laughs> because we were only able to visit Hiller River last Monday. So, um, Gila River, actually, we, we felt very privileged to be able to visit Gila River because it's one of the camps. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the Boston image on. <laughs> um, it's, it's one of the camps that is most difficult to visit, to get an entry permit. So people generally go there when there's a cleanup of the memorial. Um, and over the last year, it's been completely closed uh, because of COVID. Uh, so the Indian reservation has been under lockdown. Uh, but we we got a, you know, amazing help from them uh, to be able to go there and take photos so that they would make it uh, for the book, uh, which will go to the print in October. No? Um, so in Hiller River, the story is different. Uh, from uh, Boston uh, because um, the government never, it was under the administration of the War Relocation Authority and the government never uh, honored its commitments. No? So they had committed to um, give 8,500 8, acres of farmland and that never happened. Um, they committed to remove all the infrastructure because in that part uh, the Indian tribes uh, didn't want to have anything. Um, so they halfly removed some of the pipes and the electricity lines, but they left half so, of, of the rest. So it was unusable and it was just ruining uh, the land. Um, so so it, it's a completely different feel uh, from Boston. No? Um, one of the things that struck us is how difficult it is to get there uh, logistically. So you get through something that looks barely like a dirt road where you can very easily get lost. We were fortunate that uh, we got uh, you know, Paul Short Hair as, uh, escorting us and showing us the different places. There are many more remains than what we were expecting. And something that is very distinct are the fish ponds. Uh, there were dozens of fish ponds that were built uh, for decoration, uh, but also to cool the barracks. So some of them were built under the barracks or next to the barracks, no? because the heat was there, you know, terrible. We we had to start our shooting at uh, 5:30 a.m. in the morning, and by 7:15 <laughs> we were barely able to breathe. So, so we we thought that uh, it was probably one of the most inhospitable places uh, that uh, that we visited, no, of the ten camps. The person or the character that we picked for uh, Hila River is Inoshita, uh, Mas Inoshita who fought in the 442nd and um, he was the one that started the cleanup of the memorial and also started to build a very strong friendship um, with, the, with the Indian tribes and uh, just as an illustration of, of how you know, strong the relationship is is that um, he's, there's a memorial for him in the Ira Hayes uh, Memorial Park in Sakaton, uh, and that's the only person that is known 
Indian uh, <laughs> that has a memorial. Mm -hmm. Um, and Ira Hayes, um, I guess m m most of you know who Ira Hayes was, but he, he was one of the six people in the Iwo Jima uh, photograph, the famous Iwo Jima photograph raising the American flag. Uh, so he was one of the six. No? And um, he, you know, he was considered as a war hero, and uh, he was featured in, in several films, and you know, he, he's got a a very interesting but uh, but sad story that uh, we may be able to talk uh, later. And I'll turn it over to Sandy. So I'm going to talk about the Arkansas camps now, um, uh, Rohr and uh, Jerome. And they were often referred to, when, when I was asking people about them, a few people told me they were the forgotten camps. And I think much of that has to do with the fact that they're in Arkansas, they're far away from large Japanese American communities. Um, they had a unique experience there, though. I'm, gl I'm glad that we went there, and I'm glad that we talked to people who went there. Uh, first of all, the incarcerees were there during um, Jim Crow era. <coughs> so they talked about how shocking it was to see you know, white bathrooms and black bathrooms and also how strange it was to be told to use the, the white bathroom because they thought they were in the camps because they weren't white. So, you know, that they, they were just, um, um, but um, there's not a lot left um, of, uh, of Rower and Jerome because, um, I think partly because unlike the other places, they're not in, in a desert. They were in a swampy area, but you could grow crops there. So, um, so what is mainly left of Rower is uh, the Memorial Cemetery, and I feel like it sort of rises up like an oasis out of the farmland. You know, when you drive up, this is what you see. Um, there are uh, uh, burial sites for people who died uh, at at uh, Rower, and there are also um, there are also memorials, uh, stone memorials for people who um, died, and also. Uh, to honor the soldiers in the 442nd, 100th Battalion. <clears throat> While we were there, we got to know Rosalie Gould, who was a former mayor of um, McGee, Arkansas. And she was uh, very active in trying to preserve the cemetery. She was also our guardian angel. And so I have an embarrassing story, but everyone tells me I have to tell it. Uh, and and Erin just, we were, many people told us, this is a swamp, be careful. You know, you shouldn't drive into puddles. But anyway, we drove into a puddle and we got stuck. And uh, we were out um, probably, I don't know, a quarter of a mile from the cemetery, at, back in the back roads. And uh, the cell phone was really weak. In fact, I couldn't get it at first, and uh, it was the sun was setting. So we called Rosalie because we couldn't figure out how a tow, you know, how even a tow truck would find us. So we told her, I got Rosalie on the phone, and um, and we told her what happened, and she sent her nephew to pull us out of the mud. So, <laughs> so she was our guardian angel. And and this, as you can see, the farmland. Um, around the cemetery. Uh, Jerome is on completely on private property. It's owned by the Ellington family, but they are great about having Japanese Americans visit. If, if any of you are interested in going and you contact them, they, they are really um, very generous with their time. In fact, they kept, uh, if you can see in the corner there, that's the hospital smokestack. They kept that there so that incarcerees could find uh, the land. You, you can see it from this angle also, this smokestack is there. They also worked with the Japanese American community to get a um, memorial marker set up at the beginning of their driveway. So from the road, you can, you can see it. We got there uh, early, like 7 o'clock one morning, and Preston, who is the manager of the farm, was there waiting for us. We have no idea how he knew we were coming, but you know, a small small town, <laughs> somehow he knew. And we got there, 
and um, he said that he was going to take us around. Mm -hmm. He could show us where the different foundations were, mm -hmm. and he also said that he, he, he had a shovel with him, and he said that um, he would go with us because there were rattlesnakes there, mm -hmm. and if a rattlesnake popped up and tried to bite, uh, bite us, he would strike dead the rattlesnake for us. So we, we were very grateful for Preston's help. Um, and so he showed us, uh, as you can see here, the, one of the original foundations that's surrounded um, by uh, trees and growth. There were several of them he, he, he showed us. And then some of the other foundations. And there was a house that was made out of a, a barrack. Um, and, and even though there weren't um, the kind of structures that you would, you, we found at some of the other camps, I still found that this land was really, really imbued with memories. I, I thought a lot about a conversation I'd had um, with Linda Sachiko Morse, whose grandmother, May, was incarcerated at Jerome, and her grandmother is the, the subject of the, the, the chapter we do on Jerome. Uh, what really struck me in talking to Linda is she's a civil rights attorney and has become active in Sioux for Solidarity, which supports immigrant and refugee groups. And they seek to be the allies that, that their families needed during World War II. Um, and earlier, Katiana referred to Donna's research, and one of the things that uh, Donna talks about in her essay um, is the fact that um, that many times Yonsei have gone into law or other um, social justice areas because of what happened to their families. So it's nice to know some good things have come of this and um, I thought a lot about my conversations with Donna as I uh, wandered through, um, through Jerome. So Manzanar. So Manzanar uh, was the, in California, it was the first camp to be established. So the War Relocation Authority used it also to test a lot of things uh, that they would then incorporate in the other camps. But the feature that um, we picked in, uh, from Manzanar, it was the camp that, um, uh, where the orphanage was located. So as uh, Col Colonel DeWitt said, as long as someone uh, has a drop of Japanese blood, he needs to go to the camps. And even so, kids and babies uh, were considered as a, as a threat uh, to, for national, to national security. So um, orphans were rounded up from different orphanages or tracked down uh, in, in their foster families and taken from their foster families um, so that they would all be taken to Manzanar. Um, the person that we picked from Manzanar was uh, Dennis uh, Tojo Bambauer, who is the tall kid in the group. Um, so Dennis uh, was half uh, Japanese American, half Irish French. So his mother was Japanese of Japanese descent, and his father was of Irish French descent. And he was taken by his mother when he was a baby because he was born out of wedlock um, into the orphanage. And he was in a Caucasian orphanage because they were actually segregated in in California. And um, a government official tracked him down and found out that his mother was uh, of Japanese descent, so he was sent into the orphanage. No? So um, something I interesting that uh, he, sa he says in his oral history is that uh, he was very much teased uh, while he was in camp because, well, first he didn't look uh, Japanese, and secondly, his surname was Tojo which is, you know, the very dreaded uh, prime minister and, and general, uh, Japanese uh, general and prime minister from World War uh, II. So this is a site of, uh, of, uh, of Manzanar with those uh, beautiful mountains uh, at the back. And um, so we have a quote uh, from Dennis' oral history. Uh, I remember driving up to the gates 
and seeing the guard tower and the barbed wire fence, and this blew my mind. He, he was a, a seven-year-old kid. This is a view uh, from the mess hall uh, out into the you know, very barren uh, landscape. And then uh, we actually feature, featured uh, a second uh, person in Manzanar uh, in relation to the orphanage. And that, that was uh, Sohe Hori. Uh, so Sohe Hori um, was a teenager when he was incarcerated in Manzanar. He wasn't an orphanage, but he volunteered uh, to work in the orphanage. And uh, we picked him because uh, we've seen accounts of former um, of kids who are in the orphanage who have very strong and vivid memories of uh, Sohei Hori. So he was really important uh, in their lives. No? So he used to, he was a great uh, storyteller and he used to listen to them and also entertain them. And uh, he would uh, tell them stories about Les Miserables, uh, which was the book <laughs> that he was reading. And uh, people now as adults still remember how he told these stories and uh, you know, exactly uh, even his gestures when he was telling them. No? Uh, he was a great sketcher and writer and he's got a, a collection of uh, wonderful letters uh, that he sent to his friend uh, Harold Langdon. Uh, so we've actually included two of those letters with some of the sketches uh, in the book. This is uh, the mess hall. This is just a, met a metaphoric uh, photograph. <laughs> the inside of a barrack, and then the tower at night. <coughs> um, a few people mentioned to me, a few people mentioned to me that, um, oh, is this one? No, okay. <laughs> um, that uh, Minidoka was known as a good camp. Um, and uh, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that it had the highest rate of volunteers to the Army. So I wondered why that was. And one person put up a theory. They said it's, pos it's possible that the um, administrators there were a bit more empathetic and maybe a bit more reasonable. So I don't know how you measure that or go about looking at that, but I was curious, and so I found a diary by Arthur Kleinkopf, um, and um, he was the superintendent of education, and he kept a diary from 1942 to 1946 when the camp closed. And what's, what really struck me is in his diary, he writes a lot, very honestly, about how bad the conditions are at the camp. He says the, the latrines are a health menace, the flies are everywhere, and the odor is bad. These people are living in the midst of a desert where they see nothing except tar paper covered barracks, sagebrush, and rocks. This dull, dreary existence in a desert region must give these people a feeling of helplessness, hopelessness, and despair, which we on the outside do not and will never fully understand. This is baseball field. This was a fire station. So I don't know if that he, he did seem to be sincerely concerned about the conditions. I don't know if that translated to a more reasonable camp policies, but you know, perhaps. Um, certainly he seemed more sympathetic than when you read the comments of some of the administrators at other places. Heart Mountain. We saved Heart Mountain for last, in part because we hope that this will lead into a discussion of your thoughts about memory and landscape. 
uh, in the book, in the chapter, the person that we um, we profiled was Takashi Hoshizaki and other courageous Japanese Americans who resisted the draft. They said they would gladly serve as soon as their families were released from prison and their constitutional rights were restored. Shortly before she died, my mother told me she was sorry that the Japanese Americans did not fight harder for their rights. I really wish she could have met Takashi. She would have been so proud to have heard his story. And I'd like to ask you what memories the landscape here brings to you as you look at the barracks and the root cellar, the hospital grounds, Heart Mountain, and the other foundation. Thank you. We love questions. <laughs> Anyone have questions or thoughts? Thoughts about memory and thoughts about walking around Heart Mountain? What it's. Well, I have a question for you. Sure. <laughs> if nobody else does. I'm, I'm really, I was really struck by the by your approach of using drones. Uh, you know, because usually before drones came about, it you would have done it differently. You would have, you know taken it from ground level. Well, what did you think that the drones told you that, that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise? And were people that you talked to uh, conscious of the changes that had taken place? And yeah, I think um, some of our interest in using drone photography was, you know, our work is a digital humanities project, and so we're interested in using digital tools. There's so much available. Part of our project will also be sort of a map and you know, um, or at least directing folks to sites of shame, the sort of incredible uh, map that Dencho's put together. And so we were just thinking both about bringing digital tools to this sort of storytelling, um, but then also scales of seeing. Um, I think your photographs are so beautiful and there's so much that's captured right there. Um, and so we were sort of curious, like what, what can you see from above? Um, because, you know, you can sort of get more of a sense of the expanse of some of these sites or the lack thereof mm -hmm. um, and so I think our our walking tours will sort of allow folks hopefully to see things at different scales both like the sort of 360 being able to look around um, the walking and looking sort of at at face value or looking out from sort of you know the entrance or something and then from above just to see what is still there mm -hmm. um, because there's so much like that expression being in the weeds of something or not being able to see the forest for the trees is literally very true um, and so there's just something and I think it, it can flip your perspective a little bit to be looking from above and to have to sort of orient yourself and help yourself understand what you're seeing um, I was always nervous about flying the drone because it seems invasive to me. There is, you know, a part of our project that's also thinking about drones um, and surveillance and state surveillance and, you know, how drones have been used at places like Standing Rock um, to sort of surveil native activists, but then how sort of those same activists have used a form of surveillance um, to sort of spy on the state. So there's a sort of thread to our project that's also using this technology to sort of spy on the state in a way or to see the remains of these prisons. Um, that's for the more academic, less fun talks, I think, but it's definitely there. Um, and there's a lot of considerations. I mean, as, as you all faced also, going to these sites and engaging sort of ethically, not just with the stories and the histories, but the folks who are there, have been there, have their own ties to to the sites um, that makes for some really interesting navigating. Mm -hmm. Yes. A quick comment about the uh, use of drones, and I think that there's um, good possibilities for some of the other camps, especially where there's uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. still there. Like I know that Truly Lake has. Uh, uh, a lot more concrete cabs where the, the trees were. There's out in the back, there's the old uh, sewage treatment plant mm -hmm. facility that they have there, and, uh, and there's the jail and, and other things that might be really nice to be able to get. 
throwing shots of, of, of different places. So, yeah. So keep at it. <laughs> yeah, and there are a lot of folks who are doing this sort of work too that we're hoping to sort of, I don't know, some of it's like not wanting to repeat work. So how can we sort of signal boost and direct folks to people who are doing this kind of work at other sites to make it possible to see. But yeah, it's we're excited to sort of think about where where next. Other question? Oh, I, uh, Sandy and I live in Colorado, and I recently went to Amachi, and that's the first time I've ever been to a camp. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I want to talk about is John Hopper was there, and he was so moving because he had all these kids that had the same color t-shirt that were part of the Amachi Preservation Society. Mm -hmm. High school age, none of them of Japanese descent. Mm -hmm. They were so proud to show us among us. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, that part is the part I want to take away. Mm -hmm. um, there was a Japanese official who was there to give John a award. He seemed like the most modest, wonderful person. Mm -hmm. The National Park Society, National uh, Park Society uh, representatives who would be taking over that area, because that's just happened, as you mm -hmm. know, were there, and they were very grateful to John, and very seemed very excited about taking this over as a park service project. Um, one of the things that hit me also is that there were some growth. Well, all of the trees were built were planted by those who were interned there, mm -hmm. and they still live. They also found some roses recently that have grown, mm -hmm. and, they, and the Denver Botanical Society has taken those, a portion of those, and taken them to the Botanical Society, and they're growing them. We happened to sit next to two Caucasian, really cute guys who were young, who were doing a documentary on that. Mm -hmm. And they were so proud of that. And they were planning on growing these roses to give to all the uh, descendants of those who had been to the Machi. There was also a group from uh, the University of Denver who are into archaeology. And they go out there and they do a lot of digs. I'm not sure how much they find, but it's an experience for them. And so there are so many different groups that are paying attention to this still. And there are a lot of programs on it now that are developing, including some local, which I think are great, but you know, they are working on that. And so I was really trying to look to the future and think about the good things and the good people. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, this hit me in so many ways because I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. My parents were born in California. My dad was a cardiovascular surgeon. My mother was a bacteriologist at the time that they were told to get it together and go to camp. I didn't know anything about it. And so I'm in high school and somebody shows up at our house mm -hmm. with these watercolors and says, these are from camp. And I think, oh, swimming, tennis. <laughs> you know, I had no idea. They never talked about it in school. My parents never talked about it. They probably said four sentences about it. And that's all I ever heard from them. And you kind of knew not to ask them because you could tell they didn't want to talk about it. And so, and my, my dad was always someone who looked to the future. He said, you need to integrate, you need to be part of society, you need to get out there and, and mix in. And so we ended up in Arkansas because they asked my dad to come start the open heart surgery program in Arkansas. So although there were camps there, and I had no idea until years later after I left Arkansas. That's how we ended up in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is my dad was at Tule Lake, my dad and my mom, and they asked to go there because my dad wanted to work with some physicians there. All I knew about Tule Lake was it was where dissidents were put. Mm -hmm. So I, I have no knowledge of their experience whatsoever. But what I do know is that my dad fought really hard because school, uh, schools, mm -hmm. Uh, were integrated at the time I was growing up, but there were separate bathrooms, separate hospital beds, mm -hmm. sections for blacks and for whites, and so my dad fought really hard for integration. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really understand why. I didn't know all this background of what had happened to them. Mm -hmm. And what I'd say about Arkansas, people have such an image about the South being so prejudiced, and I don't disagree with that. But 
there weren't enough Asians to be prejudiced against. It's not <laughs> I think there was one other family that I knew in the state. And so everybody thought I was white. So we either checked black or white. So I thought I was white. I always checked white. But when I went to Europe and, and college with a friend, and people started relating to me as Japanese, and she kind of looked at me and said, oh. <laughs> and, um, and the same thing, I keep up with four very good friends from Arkansas who are probably politically very different than me, and we don't talk politics. But they have the same feeling. They're like, we never thought about your being Japanese. The main thing is if you're born in the South, then you're a Southerner. And I think you know, people tend to accept that. But I just want to kind of disabuse people of the fact that everybody in Arkansas is always racist. There's certainly racism. But they were very kind to me. And I had a great childhood. And so when you talk about feeling left out or not being part of society, I have a lot of gratitude because I grew up in a place that's very accepting. And I feel more conflicted now because I'm learning more about the past and starting to realize that I need to kind of start dealing with that. Because I just kind of put a lid on it after my parents stopped talking about it. Mm -hmm. I read a little bit of it. I read a book called Hard Math and that was fiction mm -hmm. and learned a little. But when I started to read about the real stuff, I couldn't really do it because I thought this is not benefiting me. It's making, it's bringing out bad feelings that are not healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm trying to move on into the future, but I'm stuck right now. Because mm -hmm. I think as you get older, you start reflecting a lot more about your childhood. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think the Japanese don't really want to talk about the things they're proud of. Or, I mean, they feel prideful if they talk about their heritage and things they're proud of. And so I think it's time to just start kind of dealing with that and mm -hmm. thinking about all the things we've accomplished and what we can do in the future. How much we have accomplished and so 